Hi, I'm Rob, N1NUG. Today I wanted to talk about an interesting phenomena that I observed on six meters a few months back. Now I've done a little digging into this, at least enough to satisfy kind of a basic explanation as to what's going on here. I'm certainly not an expert in this topic, so if you want to learn more, I encourage you to kind of dig in and do a little more research on your own. Now if this is a phenomena that you're familiar with and know a little bit more detail about that I'm presenting in the video, feel free to share it down in the comments so that we can all kind of learn from it. Now the other thing I wanted to let you guys know is that I recorded all of the clips from six meters back at the end of March in 2023 and it's now kind of the middle of October in 2023. So it's taken me a little while to kind of put this video together, but I think you guys will still enjoy it. Now what you're going to see in these clips that I'm about to share with you are some observations that I made while running 6 meter FT8. So back in the spring, 6 meter activity was a bit sporadic. So I would have it sort of up in the background on one of my other monitors and just keep an eye out of the corner of my eye to see if I saw anything on the waterfall. And if it was there, I would try to work the station. Now, while I was doing that, I happened to notice one signal that was relatively strong coming from AB1OC, who's about, I don't know, 70 or 80 miles north of me. But I started to notice that sometimes when he popped up on the waterfall, his signal was also quite wide. And I thought that was kind of odd given the fact that AB1OC is Fred, he's a well-known ham, he's our division director, and I wouldn't expect him to be running a station that would be wider than it needed to be. Now he may be running a lot of power up there, uh, I think he's into 6 meter DX, that kind of a thing, but I still wouldn't expect his FT8 signal to be wide. So then I got to thinking that something else is going on here. There's nothing wrong with Fred's station. I'm seeing some kind of an image or something, and I wanted to know why. <laughs> so I did a little research, and I found out that this is classic multipath that you would see on VHF. And what that means is that you can have a signal that is kind of directed towards you, and you're picking up that main signal, but you can also pick up a reflection off of another hill or a mountain or a water tower or whatever. The signal, when it's bouncing off of whatever it's bouncing off of, is taking an extra, I don't know, millisecond or two to get to your receiver, so it looks like it's on a different frequency because of that. So anyway, let me head over to the computer and show you what I saw. Before we look at Fred's signal, let's take a quick look at sort of a normal signal. Here's NQ1K. And you can see right here, he's really the only signal we're hearing on the band right now. And in the waterfall, you can see that his signal is occupying about 50 hertz or so, which is about what you'd expect. Now, if I played this through a couple more cycles, you'd see that his signal starts to kind of weaken. And it was kind of coming and going as the band was sort of coming and going. And this is pretty much what I would consider normal for six meters. In the next few clips, I didn't adequately explain that I was using my five element six meter Yagi as I was receiving the signal to kind of point it in different directions. In the first clip, you'll see that the signal is strongest. And that's when I had the antenna pointed directly at AB1OC's QTH. In the following clips where the signal is weaker and more spread out, that's when I started to turn the antenna away in different directions to see if I could pick up the reflections. And as you'll see, I most certainly did. And then in the very last transmission of AB1OCs, the antenna was pointed back in his direction and the reflections were gone. So here's a look at the recording that I made from Fred, AB1OCs sort of transmissions on six meters on this day in March. You can see this particular transmission is quite strong but looks fairly normal for an FT8 transmission, about 50 hertz wide or so, with maybe a little fringing on the sides, but that's pretty normal. On this next transmission, you can see there's a definite main signal, and then there's sort of an image on the left and maybe even something on the right. This thing has kind of spread out and gotten kind of wide, but again, very clearly defined main signal and sort of weak secondary or image signal over here on the left. 
And on the next transmission, you can see that those images have really started to get strong. Both sides of the main signal are showing it now. And if we keep going, we now almost have three distinct signals here. One definite strong one here, one fairly strong image here, and one over on the right. Now at this point you can also see down here that AB10C has made contact with N1DCH at this point. Now at first I thought maybe that was N1DCH signal, but that didn't make sense because N1DCH has to transmit in the interval when AB10C isn't. So this is definitely coming from AB10C's transmission. Over this short amount of time, a few minutes, whatever we've been kind of looking at, the signal started off normally and it spread out and turned into two or maybe three signals. And now you can see here at this point, it's starting to coalesce back on itself and turn into one signal. Now you can see on this transmission, <laughs> we're back to one solid strong signal. So the multipath has pretty much gone away. Now here's yet another signal that I was seeing this happen to. In this particular case, it was K1SIX, who, again, I think is in New Hampshire. <laughs> maybe this is a New Hampshire thing, I don't know. Or maybe their signals are just bouncing off of the mountains up there and taking multiple paths to get to my receiving antenna. Speaking of K1SIX, seems like he's pretty hardcore into VHF. In fact, he's got a website with tons of information on it that he has collected and reported on over the years about propagation on VHF. I came across this excellent write-up and analysis about his observations and experience with multipath on six meter FT8. Now, as you read through this document, I think you'll find that it is quite defensive and K1SIX is pretty salty about whatever accusations he's received about interference on six meter FT8. So you've got to work around that and try and pull out the relevant details about the phenomena that we're observing here in this video, because I think he does a good job of explaining it once he gets kind of around the politics, I'll say, of whatever it is he's dealing with. But again, if you can get past all of that, this document is well worth the read and is full of some great information that you can use to supplement what I'm trying to show here. Let's take a little more detailed look as to what I think is going on using a map of southern New England and some crude sketching that I've done to try and illustrate my point. The straight red line shows the direct path between AB1OC's approximate location here in southern New Hampshire and my approximate location in north central Connecticut. Now, as we know, radio waves don't travel on straight vectors. The way they work is more like ripples on a pond. They emanate from the transmitting antenna out in sort of ripples or waves at whatever frequency they're transmitting on. And that's what my teal lines here are supposed to indicate. This is AB1OC signal spreading out from his antenna and traveling southwest through southern New England. Now there's plenty of topography here in eastern Connecticut and central Massachusetts, hills, valleys, lakes, buildings, what have you. But one of the more prominent uh, geological features in southern New England are the Berkshire Mountains over here in western Connecticut and western Massachusetts. So what I think might be happening is that when my antenna is pointed directly in the direction of AB1OC, I'm receiving just his strong initial signal, or the teal lines. But when I start to turn the antenna away and point it sort of in the direction of this ridge line to my west and southwest, I'm now receiving a reflection of that signal that's bouncing off those hills to my west, and that's what I'm trying to depict as these blue lines. So in other words, when my antenna is pointed this way or northeast, I'm receiving pretty much only the initial signal. But when it's pointed southwest, I'm receiving the image signal bouncing off of this ridge as well as the initial signal off the back of the antenna at the same time. And by definition, because I'm receiving the same signal on two different paths to my receiving antenna, that's pretty much what you could consider multipath. Now the reason that we end up seeing sort of two signals in the FT8 waterfall 
is that the initial signal takes less time to reach my antenna than the reflected signal because the initial signal has to travel further and bounce off of this ridge line and then bounce back. Now frequency is a product of time, so if you increase the time, you're going to actually change the frequency at which you are receiving the signal on. And that's why we're seeing it the way we are in the waterfall. As I said earlier in the video, I'm no expert. This was just one example that was sort of easy to put together, easy to explain, and easy to visualize in a video. I'm sure that the actual propagation path and mode that we're observing here is a lot more complex. In reality, the signals are probably bouncing off of multiple objects. Not just the hills over in western Connecticut, but probably the ocean too, as the signals pass over the curvature of the Earth. Uh, maybe they're also bouncing off of sporadic e-clouds in the ionosphere. And beyond that, they could even be bouncing off of UFOs in orbit around the planet. Who really knows for sure? Now, I've been playing with radio on and off for over 30 years now, so I was aware of multipath and kind of what it was, but I never really took a detailed look at it until I saw that anomaly on FT8 and wanted to learn more. So I hope this little demonstration encourages you to go out and do a little bit of research on this interesting propagation phenomenon. Now, if you're new to the hobby or are just looking at multipath for the first time through this video, I encourage you to do some research and get a little more information, and I'll leave some links down below that may be helpful. Now, if you're someone that's more seasoned and has maybe a more detailed understanding of multipath than what I've presented here, feel free to leave a comment down below so we can all take a look at it. But that's all I've got for now. Thanks for watching. Ready? 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 Ready?